We will interview each of the four candidates for governor leading up to the midterm elections. Now, last week, we spoke with Dr. Irvin Yen, an independent. On October 28th, moderator Susan Goodell will sit down with Democrat Joy Hoffmeister. And the following week, her guest will be the incumbent Governor Kevin Stitt. This week, we hear from the Libertarian candidate, Natalie Bruno. Here's Susan Cadeau. Rich, we have invited every gubernatorial candidate in Oklahoma to our studios for a 15-minute in-depth interview. To keep things fair, we have the same list of topics for each candidate, but we'll ask follow-up questions if I think we need more of an explanation on what they have to say. With that, let's get started on this week's interview with Libertarian candidate Natalie Bruno. Ms. Bruno, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the first question I like to air ask everyone is, tell us a little bit about yourself. What don't we know about you? Yeah, so I have been pretty transparent on all of my websites. I try to put out as much information as possible. Um, but I was actually born in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, my father was in the military for 32 years, so I went to public school there for a little bit. Then, as military families do, we ping-ponged all over the place. Um, and then I graduated high school in Texas, came back when I was 18, where I've remained ever since. I'm not going to say how long that's been. Um, but I have a, a blended family with my husband, Taylor. We have six children, mm -hmm. um, twin daughters, and four sons. And, um, you know, I've been really big within the philanthropy space. I do marketing and advertising for my, my normal nine to five, but um, have spent a lot of time with children and then the criminal justice reform space. All right, now my next question. Why did you want to run for governor? And what I'm looking for is what was the evidence? What was the moment where you said, you know what, I'm gonna run for governor, what happened? Yeah, so um, I initially, so I've been involved in politics, but on the back end of things. So I've helped run uh, campaigns I was actually Joe Jorgensen's marketing director in the last presidential campaign. So I had been involved in politics, but I had never planned on being a candidate, really, mm -hmm. until, you know, within that criminal justice space and within the child space. So as I mentioned previously, I was a CASA volunteer mm -hmm. uh, for six years in Carter County. Um, I've coached youth sports. I'm the chair for the associate board for Oklahoma Lawyers for Children. And then I work with tons of nonprofits in criminal justice. And you have these issues where you run into barriers all the time, where you cannot really help people or help issues unless you change them legislatively. And then why, you know, governor versus running for Senate or something like that is because since we are, even though we're the third largest party, the Libertarian Party is, we're still obviously much smaller than the other two. So if I were to have been elected in a Senate position, any type of sway I would have on legislation would be very tiny. But the ability to run for governor, I would be able to have the opportunity to veto bills. I would have a lot more influence. And then on top of that, it would allow our, um, our legislation to actually work together since I don't appease to a red or a blue side and it would allow for a lot more crossover. All right, so in your work with children, one of the big issues right now is education and funding and, mm -hmm. and, and prioritizing children in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on where things stand right now with education, i.e. vouchers for schools or uh, parent involvement in what goes on in a school? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I have six kids. Um, I have four and plus two bonus children. And they are in a combination of public school and charter school and private school. And then I even pulled my sons out and homeschooled them, not like, you know, virtual, like completely homeschooled them during COVID. And I think that what we have is a couple of different things. One is we have a lack of parents being able to really have control over the kid's education. Secondly, we have an issue where there's been too much government overreach and involvement. Even from like a legislative standpoint, when it comes to choosing classes, right? We very much so say, you need these and you don't need these and you need these. And it really kind of puts children in an awkward kind of position when you have children that are forced to take classes that, you know, maybe aren't to their, you know, best interest. And then when it comes to vouchers, um, so I support vouchers, but not in the way that the Republican Party has been pushing them. I, Currently, my twin daughters have autism, and they use the Lindsay Nicole Henry grant, which is the closest thing to a voucher system that we currently have. Essentially, what it is, is anybody who is on an IEP has the ability to- What is IEP? An IEP, an individualized education plan. Okay. So um, autism, things like that, they would potentially have an IEP within the education space. Okay. They have the ability to essentially be ranked and be given a voucher to go to a private school. 
um, if they feel like that the classroom size and stuff would help them more so than the public school that they're assigned to would be able to. And it was a game changer for my daughters. Um, Liliana, one of my oldest, she's actually gonna be graduating high school this year with autism and with ADHD and had a 31 on her ACT, um, you know, an unweighted almost 4.0, and she's gonna be going to OSU um, next fall. And these are all things that I feel confident she wouldn't have been able to achieve if she was forced to stay in a regular public school setting just because of the class sizes and things like that. So I would like to see a voucher program that is weighted towards rural and low income. And I would also like to see it to where um, a certain percentage of it is forced to stay in the public school sector. And I think that we can marry those two together and have better outcomes. But when you look at the fact that mm -hmm. in rural areas there are not as many private schools. Right. That, so parents may, would have to drive a long way to take advantage of the voucher system. So would it really kind of impact um, more urban areas than Oklahoma's more rural areas? So I don't believe so and this is the reason why. So when we wait, so each child essentially has a dollar amount that's assigned to them. And as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to see weighted for rural and for lower income. So they could actually potentially get more funding towards their school because of the fact that for each child, they're having a higher dollar amount because that dollar amount follows them to the public school or a private school. It's not only if you want to take it and go to a private school. On top of that, if there's opportunities for funding to go outside of the traditional public school, I think we're going to see a lot more satellite um, charter schools and private schools pop up in some of these rural areas because there's going to be a demand and therefore a need to be met. Right. The argument had been that if we lose the public schools in these um, rural communities, mm -hmm. that it would really impact the uh, community, the entire community mm -hmm. negatively. Right. But you think the uh, new private schools showing up to service those vouchers would compensate for that? I'm not even saying necessarily private schools, but having more funding. So for example, let's say right now, and I'm just, I can't remember the exact number, but let's say each child gets $7,000 that's mm -hmm. assigned to them um, for each school that they go to based off of funding. If we change the system to where the rural and lower income actually have a higher value than what the regular um, you know, higher income and metro kids have, they could actually potentially getting to their public school more funding per child because that might jump up to $10,000 per kid mm -hmm. because of the fact that they have a higher weighted. So they, those dollars could still go to their public school. The voucher systems that I have seen and I've been looking at, it's not only you can take this and go to a private school. It means that each child has a, a value to them that can go to their individual public school as well. All right. This is something we could stay on forever, but yes, we do no, have other topics of yes, concern. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that, that's me uh, focusing on that. But mm -hmm. um, let's talk energy versus environment in mm -hmm. Oklahoma, where energy is so vital to the economy. Absolutely. What is your stance on how do you balance supporting the energy sector and protecting the environment? I think that it has to do a lot with, with pivoting a little bit. So I deeply appreciate, obviously, our oil and gas industry. They have been phenomenal for us, not only from um, a taxation standpoint and bringing in funds into the state, but providing jobs and providing energy. Mm -hmm. And I do know that we have done a great job at trying to bring in some more um, solar energy and wind energy. I'd like to see us do that a little bit faster pace than we have been. Um, and then also looking into other, uh, excuse me, other types of energy as well. Um, you know, libertarians are, are known a lot for talking about nuclear energy and people hear the word nuclear and they kind of, you know, freak out a little bit and they think of Chernobyl, but uh, nuclear energy actually has some of the cleanest burning energy um, that's available. And so I would like to see us obviously still appreciate and hold on to um, the, you know, oil and gas industries, we have it, but really try to start pivoting and bringing in some of those other clean burning um, energy sources. Now, when it comes to the, the oil and gas energy, do you think they've been treated fairly in the past few years? See, that's where I think it's a little bit tricky because it's, how do we define fair? You know what I mean? Because I know that there has, we have a lot of regulation mm -hmm. within those areas. And I think that sometimes, and not even just with oil and gas, but other areas as well, we have legislators that put laws in place without really understanding the effects of, of how it affects those industries. Obviously, lobbyists try to come in and educate as best they can. Uh, but I think that in some ways they have, but in some ways they haven't. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I'm not an oil and gas person. Um, I've never been in that industry. So that's where I rely a lot on the professionals that are to help give me, you know, that information to let me know, um, you know, in what bills specifically would be higher or lower. Another big topic in Oklahoma and nationally is the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 
Oklahoma has been said to have the strictest abortion laws in the nation. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the abortion issue? Are you pro-life? Are you pro-choice? Do you have a cutoff time for if you're pro-choice? Yes, yeah, so, and this is one actually, if I get to pick a topic to go a little bit over on, this is probably it. Um, I am easily the most pro-choice candidate on the ballot. Um, I know Yin likes to, to kind of mention that he is, but um, he actually was pro-life up until his changeover into independent. Um, Joy, she even says she personally is pro-life, um, but believes that the extremes on both sides. Um, and the, I am extremely pro-choice and this is why. Whenever it comes to abortion, that's really only the, one of the few areas where we try to involve ourselves in medical decisions that we always traditionally have allowed doctors to be the experts and make determinations on those things. And there is this misconception that the only abortions that are happening are these frivolous women that are going out and making these choices and they just don't want to be moms and so they're just going in and having these abortions. When it's, well, it's a lot more thought out than that and there, it's way more complicated than that. And the negative effects are so much more complicated than that. Um, a perfect example that I always try to give is my own personal story. So I... Um, I'm a breast cancer survivor, I mentioned that earlier, and then I've had three C-sections with my children. And so after I had my, my third, and then especially with everything else, I was advised not to have any more pregnancies because the fact that it could be detrimental to my health and it could be detrimental to any child I would carry. So I went and had a tubal done, which in the state of Oklahoma is extremely hard to do. <laughs> um, I could not even do it during my C-section. I had to schedule a completely separate outpatient surgery because at the time I lived in Ardmore and Mercy does not allow them. And so I went in, had my tubal, but as we've heard stories, people still sometimes, because our body heals itself in weird ways, have gotten pregnant after tubals, just like they've gotten pregnant after, um, you know, um, and having, um, oh my gosh, brain fart here. Uh, the vasectomy? Yes, vasectomies, thank you. <laughs> and so if I were to become pregnant, even though it's been medically advised that it could be danger to my health to carry a child, under the current legislation, I would be forced to carry that baby until I am physically at the point where I'm dying. And then I would have the opportunity to have an abortion. And, and I have four other children, you know, that I need to raise. And it's not, there's so many more stories similar to that. Mm. Um, it is not a black and white issue. And that is why it's so important to remove government from making medical decisions whatsoever and allow those conversations to be had between women and their doctors. As our time winds down, I do want to talk about polling. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, polls were showing really Governor Stitt and Superintendent Hoffmeister and really not mentioning the other two candidates, which includes you. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on the polling? And let me ask you this. Why are you staying in the race and continuing to campaign for governor? Yes, so um, that's kind of a two-part answer. Yes. Uh, so the polling is really, as we've seen, within a week, we had one poll that showed Stitt was up 15 points, and then another one that showed that Hoffmeister was up four. So the polling is only as good as the person that's paying for it, okay? It can be, it all depends. Some of these sample sizes are very small. And then when you actually read into the specifics on the polling, a lot of times, like in this most recent one that showed that um, Stitt was at 48 and Hoffmeister was at 49, it was only polled the people who voted in the primaries. Well, independents and a lot of times didn't vote in the primaries. Um, the primary turnout in general was extremely low and anybody that planned on voting for a third party probably isn't participating in the primaries. So it gives a very skewed view. I mean, I myself have polled anywhere from 1% to 5% to 6% to 9% um, depending on who they're asking. So it's gonna be really interesting to see the differences. Um, and when it comes to the, your question about why I'm staying in the race, we as libertarians, we, had, we hit so many other goals outside of even just winning. Obviously the ultimate goal is to win. Um, but we continue to keep ballot access. Uh, in order for us to stay as a registered party in the state of Oklahoma, we have to have two and a half percent in a statewide campaign to extend it out another four years. Um, we also look at the fact that every time that we do better and better, we get more and more participation. I was invited to events that Chris Powell in the last election was not invited to. And if we were to actually give fair representation in media right from the get-go and have it not, I mean, even articles that have all four of us has a picture of Stitt and Hoffmeister. And it's been like that since the beginning. And if it was actually fair representation, I think we'd even see the polling numbers vastly different. So each time we do better and better and better, it gives the future libertarians that much better of a chance. So it's it's pretty much paving the road. 
Absolutely. Future generations. All right. Absolutely. Natalie Bruno, candidate for governor, libertarian in the state of Oklahoma. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and your time with us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. And Rich, uh, we will have uh, the Democratic candidate for governor, Joy Hoffmeister, with us next week. Back to you.